At the MRS Spring Meeting 2022, the material science community gathers in Honolulu and online to discuss new developments and research in material science. The meeting program explores a wide range of topics from morphing materials to perovskites, photocatalysts, biomaterials, and much more. And MRS TV is right here bringing you all the latest from the meeting. Aloha and welcome to the Hawaii Convention Center in Honolulu and episode three of MRS TV 2022. The meeting is well underway and we're here to catch up with some of the leaders in the field. We learn more about the possibilities of electrochemical energy storage from Thursday's Symposium X speaker. This year's MRS Impact Award winner talks to us about mentoring and engaging the community. We hear more about new and exciting developments in material science from research organizations around the globe. The new editor of the Journal of Materials Research tells us about his vision for the journal. We catch up with the MRS Outstanding Early Career Investigator Award winner. And finally, we ask you, the attendees, what you're enjoying most at the meeting. So as you can see, we have an exciting program coming up. So stay tuned for the next interview. You're watching MRS TV. And joining me now is Shirley Meng, who is giving the Symposium X Talk from Atom to System, Terascale Energy Transition with Better Batteries. Welcome. Thank you. So give us some highlights from your talk. Yeah, so I will give a very brief overview of uh, how lithium-ion battery field in the last 30 years have achieved uh, uh, great success. Um, yeah, so our field is celebrating 30 years commercialization. The first lithium-ion battery is 1992, so I want to bring the audience through the journey, how breakthroughs in science actually enabled a lot of breakthroughs in the battery technologies and uh, how we reach where we are. And then I will spend some time to give a few good examples to show why material science is so important to enable those breakthroughs. Yeah, last but not least, I will um, you know, talk about the, the future plans. Ah, let's talk about those future plans. I think, what are the, what are the biggest, um, struggles uh, in this field of research? Yeah, so um, actually the success of lithium-ion battery technology is a double-edged sword because now um, the materials used in the lithium batteries like cobalt, nickel, li even lithium itself uh, became rare commodities, right? Because the whole world, every country, every place is trying to secure uh, the materials. So it's very important for scientists like us to come out with alternative electrochemistry. Elements like sodium can do similar jobs, probably not as powerful. However, they can also provide energy storage solutions. So I think the biggest challenge for us is that come out with more alternative solutions uh, so that we can actually have a diverse portfolio of energy storage solutions. So it's really important that uh, I think to me that's probably the most important directions is for us to figure out how we can yeah, make sodium batteries, make zinc batteries, make alternative batteries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as part of this larger decarbonization effort, uh, you know, you were talking about that as a goal, what are some of the priorities then when you kind of go for this goal? I think, uh, you know, if I think about the society needs, what the society need right now is the batteries that are no longer disposables. Batteries are assets. You know, once you own the batteries in the car or you own the battery in the house, right? So it's like a refrigerator for electrons. If you have those, uh, they need to be really, you know, uh, an asset where you think about the recycling and then, you know, trade it back and then, you know, how you can regain the access after the treatment is done and then you can reuse those elements for storage. So priority number one, I would say that is to really try to figure out how we can uh, build the, the uh, battery system that are extremely resilient towards wider temperature operation, you know, wider, um, you know, I don't know, fast charging, you know, all the extreme conditions. And those requires material scientists to figure out all the degradation mechanisms, all the 
um, you know, very tiny, teeny little details from atomic and molecular level. Um, so that's where I think, uh, uh, personally for me, that's a really, really important direction. Then I think the other important priority for us is really kind of uh, um, figure out how we can actually make batteries ultimately safe. Uh, because as the world is shipping out the billions of batteries, even if your product quality is one in 10 million, you still have hundreds of problems, right? And then when battery has safety problems, it tends to really um, catch the public attention that this is unsafe. And we really have to work hard to change that notion. And from the material scientist perspective, that's a problem we can solve. Oh, I love it. I love this message. It's definitely something that uh, affects so many lives. Yep. So looking forward to that. Thank you so much, uh, Shirley Meng, for joining us today. My pleasure. So joining me now is Kwajo Oseo Asare of Wonderful. Penn State University. And you are the winner of the 2022 MRS Impact Award. That's correct. Congratulations. Thank you. And I was reading about it, not just about scientific excellence, but mentoring, diversity, right. communications. Right. And um, that's such a great aspect of this field. How did you end up going into this and how is that a part of all the work that you do? Research, ultimately, is about communication, right? If you find a new thing, you have to share with the community. And you always have to, or even teaching, it's about communication. And you always have to ask yourself, given this particular context, given this particular audience, how should I get across the point I want to make, right? Uh, but I think that part of it is also my background. I grew up in Ghana, and uh, my high school uh, was the first which was co-ed. And so one of the founders, uh, he came up with the logo, which is the piano keyboard. And he went around saying that if you want great music, you have to play both the black and the white keys. Likewise, if you want a great nation, you can't just educate the boys. You have to educate the girls. If you want to have a great nation, you can't just pay attention to the rich children, but also the poor children. For me, uh, it's very important. I almost cannot help myself, right, to just do one thing because I know that uh, other things are also important. And I was reading about the mantra in your talk, when a single tree encounters strong wind, it breaks. So yeah. I, meaningful, I think. It's Tell related. us about what it means. It, and is, it, is, it is related. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, you know, my, one of my, my experiences in Berkeley had a very, also a very influence on me besides my experiences in high school, right? I did both my bachelor's and uh, master's and PhD in Berkeley. And uh, uh, I remember when I went to Penn State, my first proposal to the NSF, the National Science Foundation, the reviewers were saying, can't be done. This, this will lead nowhere. This has no merits. And uh, I had the opportunity to write a rebuttal. And during the time when I was trying to think through how I was going to right at the bottle, one of my first graduate students saw a paper and he shared it with me. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, you're right. This solves our problem. It gives me the experimental data I need to support my program for the future. So obviously, even there, I was not a single tree in the forest. My graduate student was part of the forest in which I was operating. And that has been the story of my career throughout. Uh, my professor at Berkeley, Doug Fresno is now in his 90s and we still commiserate. He imparted in me and his group the sense of academic familyhood. Yeah, it's almost yeah. fundamental to the success of each person here. It's that family. Here in Hawaii, we call it Ohana. Ohana. Yeah, so I think it's very important um, to emphasize that and I think that's yeah. what well, you reflect. I want my students to always remember that it's not just about them, it's about us. We could talk about this forever, but we only have a very limited time. Yeah. But I appreciate you sharing well, your insight, uh, Kwajo. And congratulations again. Well, Keep up you. the great work. 
Thank you. Um, we need educators like yourself to help lift the next generation. Uh, thank you very much. Now let's take a look at some of the latest developments in the world of material science. At Tsinghua University in Beijing, research into flexible electronics has been at the cutting edge, focused on the design and fabrication of flexible integrated circuits. Let's take a closer look. Our group has been working on flexible electronic technology for more than 15 years. More than 180 patents have been authorized. In the past Olympic Winter Games in 2022, we developed a wearable chest strap to help the athletes monitoring the body temperature, ECG, and location in real time. Flexible circuit manufacturing technologies produced flexible rotation monitoring system, conformally attaching these systems into rotation parts. All the work we did require experts from different fields. We cooperate with them in a multidisciplinary approach. Batch production of live demos from Tsinghua University can be realized in IFET with eight small-scale pilot production lines. Tsinghua University and IFET will be the pioneer in bringing flexible electronics to common users, who will benefit a lot from this technology. Center for Sustainable Materials and Innovation at University of California, Berkeley is a new scientific and technological innovation hub aiming to solve some of the most pressing sustainable development goals around materials design and the circular economy. The Center for Sustainable Material and Innovation started from the very core concept of how we think about material. And our goal is to have a radical shift in the way we design, we engineer, and eventually manufacture material to add the sustainability consideration into play. Today, when we make material, we think about the efficiency, the durability of the material, but there is no information about the sustainability figure of merit. So for example, how much energy it takes to uh, reuse the material or recycle the material and what is going to be the environmental impact. So with the, this center we want to really rethink the way we make materials and have sustainability as one of the key parameters in the way we design them. The Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies, a science national user facility, offers opportunities for students and researchers at its two New Mexico facilities, Sandia and Los Alamos National Laboratories. Let's find out more. There is no better place to build a scientific career than a national user facility. It's a really exciting environment to do research. SINT stands for the Center for Integrated Nanotechnology. We have two facilities, one at Sandia National Laboratories and our gateway facility up at Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. This is a really exciting time for nanomaterials research, and that's because there's a demand for new materials at the national level. To get access to SINT, all you need to do is write a two or three page innovative science proposal or nanoscience proposal uh, that it's reviewed externally, and then once that proposal is accepted, then you're able to access all the capabilities at SINT for free. What I really enjoy about being in the SINT environment is having experts in anything you can think of right around the corner from your office. The Center for Rational Catalyst Synthesis is an NSF Industry University Cooperative Research Center. Faculty at three universities receive funding from 17 companies to do pre-competitive fundamental research to elucidate the chemical fundamentals of heterogeneous catalyst synthesis. Catalyst preparation has been called a voodoo science. 
you have to use the right incantations and spells to get the, uh, the right formulation. And so our goal in the Center for Rational Catalyst Synthesis is to turn the art of catalyst preparation into a science. The opportunity to collaborate is um, a really important aspect of not only what we're doing in research, but the mission of circus. The, the whole concept is we do academic, you know, fundamental research that's driven by technological need and opportunity. The Center for Rational Catalyst Synthesis is a wonderful place for people to develop new ideas and to cultivate new ideas. Joining me now is the new Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Materials Research, Ramamurthy Ramesh. Congratulations again for taking over the helm for Gary Messing. Tell us, what are the types of articles and research you publish? It's a Journal of Materials Research. All materials, anything that is under the purview of Materials Research Society is acceptable there. But having said that, we definitely want top quality papers papers that will change how you think about materials. So uh, papers on functional materials, you know, you know, information storage, for example, solar cells, energy materials, battery materials, biomaterial, tissues. Um, how do you make materials? You know, can you make them like you make pancakes? Or can you make them like you make Indian food? You know, put everything in and let's hope for the best. So. We welcome papers in all of those topics. And what is it about the journal that drew you? Oh, it's actually MRS. MRS is an amazing society. I mean, I've been, since my graduate school days, which is a million years ago, uh, I've been involved in MRS. And it's always stood for cutting edge science, cutting edge technology, cutting edge materials research. And so it's been fantastic on a very parochial level. It's been fantastic for my career. You know, where I am is, I think, because of MRS. And uh, helping with the journal is my way of saying thank you, MRS. Well, so what's your vision for JMR? Vision, yes, that's a good point. Vision is to make it as competitive as the big journals. Well, one aspect that's been very successful, the focus issues. Yeah. Tell us about uh, the purpose or where you want that to go. Yeah, so, um, you know, focus issues, let's say you're a new student, okay? And you want to know, you're getting into some field, let's say oxides, you know, is my field, so oxides. So you as a student need to have a single point where you could say, huh, let me go read this particular journal and I'll have a good starting point. You know, the focus issues will do that. They'll have maybe eight to 10 articles, which are all reasonably focused on one specific problem area, you know, oxide materials or tissue materials, whatever it is, they're giving you immediate jolt, immediate jump start to figure out what are the big questions that people are asking. And so we are pushing that very hard. Uh, going back to the invited speakers, uh, that's another way to get a focused issue. But you do it with one speaker at a time. And all of them, we have maybe 600 invited speakers here. And those people were saying, hey, turn around and write a very short perspective, a focused issue. Uh, uh, article which says, why was this an invited talk? And what does a student or a professor or anybody else learn from that? We are constantly pinging our uh, membership. Hey guys, if you're interested in putting together focus topics, please let us know. Come back to us, write a short one page summary of what the focus topic is, and we will evaluate and make sure that it's all consistent with our own expectations. And then we commission the, the focused issue. And how do you actually acknowledge and recognize some of the amazing work that's published? Oh, many ways. I mean, for old people like me, the, the biggest recognition is a citation. I mean, and I live and die with citations of your papers. And every year, uh, my predecessor, and I will be following that again, uh, we have the best paper uh, award. Uh, something which has had impact on people, on the readership. Uh, typically, you know, number of citations, for example. You know. So there are many ways by which, you know, the, the, uh, the society is, is, is kind of 
rewarding or thanking people for publishing impactful papers. Well, it sounds like you have a big job ahead of you. So oh, looking forward right. to seeing how it uh, plays out. You're exactly right. Yeah, and congratulations again, uh, Journal of Materials Research. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. We're MRS TV, your daily news show featuring interviews and discussions on hot topics in material science from this year's MRS meeting. You can catch us around the convention center here in Honolulu, in select hotel rooms, on the virtual MRS meeting platform, and on YouTube. And you can join the conversation on social media. With new content each day of the meeting, make sure to keep watching. And joining me now is Praneha Narang. She is the winner of the 2022 Outstanding Early Career Investigator Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor to have received this award. I know some of the previous awardees and what they've gone on to do, so I feel a little bit of pressure. First of all, you are doing a talk about illuminating quantum matter. Tell us about it. Absolutely. So my group works on how we can, you know, think about interactions in quantum matter, especially when you shine light on it. And to us, that means, you know, either a laser interacting with a particular quantum material or uh, putting some of these materials in a cavity. And you can use that to actually completely change the behavior of some of these materials. You can use that to actually, you know, create new energy technologies, new quantum technologies. So it's, it's very um, exciting. I'm going to talk about some of that later today. So when we think about these problems, we think about them from a theory perspective. You know, how can we actually model such interactions uh, in a way that it's predictive? So whatever we ideally predict is then measured. I like that order of things. Um, and hopefully the measurement somehow looks very similar to what we um, actually predicted. So you know, when you think about some of the current theory methods, and when I started my group, that was in 2017, well before COVID, um, we, we you know, start to think about how can you model such interactions in a way that is computationally tractable while still being representative of what is physically happening. So, you know, some of the interactions you could previously write down an equation and say, well, this is what it should do, but we can't exactly model it. Now we've gotten to a point where, you know, we have computers that are large enough and we also have the methods that I've developed with my group that allow you to actually model such interactions. So, these are non-equilibrium in many ways, which means that our, our material is not in a happy spot. It likes to be pushed away from its uh, equilibrium spot. And out of equilibrium, it can do things that are fundamentally different, in some cases much better than um, in equilibrium. So I'm gonna talk about all of that later today. So how did you end up studying in this field? So that's an interesting question. <laughs> it's a little bit non-linear uh, winding path. I started to think about you know, how we can build devices that are smaller, devices that could be you know, better than what we have today. And that's when I realized theory could have an impact. So when I was a graduate student, I originally thought I'd be an experimentalist. Um, and this is actually for graduate students out there still trying to figure out, you know, should I do this or that? Totally okay, I was that way. Uh, realized very quickly that you know, theory can have a role in paving the way for the experiments that come in, in future. And some of the devices, some of these interactions we're predicting can then allow us to now, you know, design new devices, new, completely new computing paradigms, for example. And that, that realization was a multi-year process for me to think that, oh, I'm going to do this very fundamental theory stuff, computational stuff. You know, I like tinkering with stuff, so I also wanted to do some experiment. Um, eventually got to a point where I said, you know, I think this theory thing is gonna work out for me. And in 2021, you actually received an award named after Mildred Dresselhaus. Did you actually get a chance to meet her? She's a pioneer. Getting the Mildred Dresselhaus Prize was, uh, yeah, another one of those moments where I thought, wow, uh, you know, this is, this is crazy and, and awesome. Um, I did get a chance to interact with Millie before uh, she passed away. Uh, she was at MIT while I was there as briefly as a postdoc. And I got a chance to you know, actually also be at a meeting where I presented and she was the meeting chair. It was a small workshop, not, not, um, you know, not one of the, the MRS meetings. But um, she had a lot of feedback and she said, 
hey, let's, uh, you're interested in this electron phonon problem. Of course, she worked in carbon nanomaterials for decades and said, you know, this same thing shows up. Have you thought about this? Um, and, and actually, that, that led us to, to write a few papers, uh, you know, of course, some that were written after she passed, but yeah. Well, thank you, Prineha. It was nice to meet you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. And finally, we asked you, the delegates, what you liked most about the meeting. This is my first time here, and um, I really am enjoying just the topics in general and meeting new people and just seeing how everybody is eager to, uh, like, I don't know, bond. And uh, not only, you know, during the conference, but even afterwards, like, do stuff together and mingle and build connections and network which is really great is for your professional life and career in general. Being able to talk to industry um, and get a really good idea of kind of what a job in industry looks like and get to actually network with people outside of the university. And yes, I've been really enjoying it. So far I've enjoyed the talks. We had a lot of exciting new information about perovskite photovoltaics and saw a lot of fantastic results from my colleagues and got a chance to present my work on transition metal dotrocotonase. So thank you. I'm enjoying it a lot. I'm meeting a lot of people in person again for the first time in a few years. And it's been very fun and productive. Just chatting with the people that I haven't gotten to like show data to in person for a long time. It's great that it was in Hawaii. It's a, such a nice place. Um, and I really enjoy all the uh, different sessions, especially the data science session. That's pretty cool. I see some state-of-art uh, machine learning models that has been applied to material science. So I really enjoy that. I'm fascinated how clever people are. Seriously, like amazing work, amazing topics to follow up, new ideas that could be implement, you know, that implemented in my study. Like, and finally, I'm like out of my jet lag, so I'm more like open now. But yeah, I, I love the exhibition. Everything is perfect. And that's it for the third day here at the MRS Spring Meeting 2022, and it's been busy. Tomorrow, we'll have more interviews with thought leaders and award winners, so make sure to tune in again. Before then, you can watch the show here at the Conference Center, in your hotel room, and online. And don't forget to subscribe and follow MRS TV on social media. We'll see you back here tomorrow.